I go back one level back to functions and functions, when we declare functions and they look like this, well, nothing really happens by declaring the function. It's when we do that last line where we say var x equals by calling that function, that's when it actually executes. What we're seeing with immediate functions is that they're going to execute immediately, as the name implies. So uh, you need to be careful here with the use of immediate functions because they are going to execute right away. And if you put them in the wrong place or use them unwisely, there might not be resources available to you yet as you're actually executing them. So you know, use them carefully. Uh, but the advantage that they bring is that you can create a whole bunch of content in them that will be hidden from view. So it, they're not going to be shown anywhere. One example that's very popular on the web right now is something called the module pattern, which makes use of these immediate functions. So to put it into perspective, var mod, which is the name of, uh, mod is the name of our variable, is equal to the result of calling an immediate function. That means that the variables that were declared in there, such as m, c, d, and y, they are not in the outer or global scope of the JavaScript uh, working space whatsoever. Because this function is returning a value, it returns an object, and inside that object, it has a method in it called get hidden year. So down below, when I look at var x equals you know, mod get hidden year, this whole line here, which is really cool to, to talk about, this whole thing is possible uh, to call that get hidden year, even though it was inside of that function because it's being returned as a method of an object coming out. I can't say mod dot, uh, uh, m mod dot c. That's not going to work because those were declared inside. But I do have that ability to go in there and call that, that method, which will return the correct result. So this is an opportunity for developers to explicitly create what they want exposed outside of that immediate function and yet keeping everything else hidden away. And you'll notice that uh, we're also making use of, and I don't know if we've explicitly mentioned them yet, but I'll just uh, show it right here, that this would be known as an anonymous function because we didn't provide it a name. So, but it does have a name as a method, get head and year, which gets exposed to the outside. So uh, pretty simple in terms of uh, implementation, but be careful with the conceptual use or the architectural use of these and make sure it aligns well with uh, whatever it is your, your architectural strategy is for your code. So with that being said, I'd love to get into a code demo, and I'm going to uh, jump into Visual Studio. And I want to uh, start creating. I'll just cruise up here, and I'm just going to start creating some functions. And in fact, even before I do that, I think it's just fun to note that I'm inside right now the default.js file of this project, which in itself, the entire code file is inside of one of these immediate functions. So uh, you know, right off the bat, anytime we declare a function inside there, we're already declaring a function within a function. So uh, I'll expand that back out. And so if I want to, I can go in here and just create a simple uh, function. So you know, function, uh, maybe I'm just going to say it's add, like what we saw before, and uh, you know, n1, n2, and you know. I'll make it return something simple, such as what you probably guessed, n1 plus n2. Great. Now, what's really interesting what you could do here is you could have another function. And you can maybe call this one uh, calc. And you could supply to it maybe uh, an n1, an n2, and maybe the uh, uh, process for uh, the calc. 
And inside there, you can make the call. Maybe it'll return process for calc and pass in N1 and N2. Now, that's a pretty interesting line of code. And if you were a C Sharp developer, you'd probably be thinking to yourself right now, boy, that looks a lot kind of like a delegate. And in a sense, that's what we're doing is we're saying, hey, I, I want to be able to pass something in here that's going to be treated like a function or a method. So in, a, in another uh, group of uh, code, maybe a, a function called uh, execute math, you can simply do something like, uh, hey, I would like to, you know, output to the, you know, set the output, uh, which is a, a little internal function I created, and set the output to the result of calling calc, passing in for, for, and add. Now notice, does it seem wrong that I didn't add the arguments there? into the parentheses for that add. Uh, you know, all I did was pass in the word add. I didn't, I didn't pass in any of those arguments. And uh, so, I don't know, that, does that feel wrong to you or, or look wrong to you? It doesn't look usual. Usually when you're talking about a function, you can identify it by the parentheses afterwards. And when they're empty, I like to call that a football. When they're empty, that usually refers to the fact that you're calling an argument without any, without any arguments at all. I'm calling a function without any arguments at all. Sure. So the, I think the thing that's kind of fun to talk about here is when we're calling the function without any parentheses whatsoever, any at all, what we're really doing is passing that function in. Not really executing, but just passing it in. So the, the word add here, uh, since that's the name of the function, think of this whole line right here. Because keep in mind, we're passing add into the calc. And we're now saying that's the new name of that process for calc, and that's where the numbers get passed in. So again, for, for people who've been doing certain types of uh, uh, languages, whether it's function pointers or delegates in, in C Sharp, uh, this is just a way for us to say, I want to pass the functionality in for those particular calls. So a uh, little syntax there, uh, hopefully to, to help the developer community out there see some of the you know, powerful features there of JavaScript. I, I'm going to collapse that whole line again just because I want to emphasize in many cases when you're going to be doing development with Windows 8, uh, and especially when we start to see tomorrow, you know, the introduction of, of other pages uh, that you're going to introduce. Right now we've kind of, uh, even though uh, Code Show has multiple pages, we kind of just kind of zoomed right in and went to the tile for it. But in, in, your, uh, in your applications, you're going to have multiple pages that you're probably going to navigate to and from. Each one of them will more than likely have their own JavaScript file, and they're typically going to be found in one of these immediate functions where you declare uh, certain things to happen. And then, of course, later on, you'll see that functions have a very strong role as well in event handling. And so uh, and when certain events happen, you can have the, that functionality called. So uh, you know, very important to understand the significant of, uh, significance of functions within uh, uh, JavaScript. So, with all that said, uh, that's one aspect. And then I noticed, and I, in fact, I had to uh, uh, bite my tongue, so to speak, when you were talking about the, the cool feature there of showing the arguments, I noticed that arguments was actually kind of related to a certain type that we're going to be getting into here. So uh, maybe since that was your demo, maybe you could chat about where I'm alluding to. Well, just exactly what type are you talking about? Uh, well, it was a list of things, so I'll give you a hint. Okay. I'll just go ahead and name it. We're going to be talking about the arrays. Arrays are really important. They, you know, they've kind of always been important. It's a list of things. Of course, they've always been important, but it seems like when we're working on the client here, um, we're, we're doing a lot of array work. We're doing lots of list work, and arrays have been a little bit abstract, a little bit um, difficult to work with in JavaScript in the past, and uh, so it's made it a very manual process. And, Honestly, the way I usually worked with arrays is I usually just worked with a, a, a more powerful, more robust server-side function and passed down the elements that I wanted to render, but, but handled all of my lists of things on the server side. Well, arrays have really gotten an upgrade. They've really evolved in the latest version of ECMAScript, and so we're going to look at some of these new features of arrays. Arrays are no more than just a list of objects. 
That's it. Just a list of strings, a list of integers, a list of objects. Could even be a list of functions. So um, arrays are really powerful, and we're going to look at how to just simply declare and instantiate arrays. And then we're going to look at a whole bunch of array functions. These are functions that you can hang right off of an array and make it act a lot like link in C sharp. So if you've, if you've used link in C sharp, you're going to see a lot. As a matter of fact, for each of these functions, there's an equivalent in C sharp. And I'll draw those out so that if you are familiar with that language, uh, then you'll be able to um, understand that. So I am working in um, just my sandbox app again. So this is not available on Code Show, but this is just some dynamic JavaScript that we're going to be writing. Now, I showed you before how I can make a variable, give it a name, and set it equal to a value, right? That's a value. That's the scalar value, we would say, because it's not multiple values. It's just one. But if I want to do multiple values, I simply use square braces. Square braces is the signature for an array. Okay? I've just created an empty array. And I actually haven't told JavaScript how many things are going to end up being in that array. And it's OK with that. The performance mm. might not be as good. In some, some cases, if you know exactly how many spots you want to reserve, it's better for you to tell it how many spots you want to reserve. But it's OK like this. So let's make this meaningful. Let's actually declare um, an array called fruit. And in our square braces, let's give it some actual fruit. So we'll do an apple, a comma, an orange, comma, and a banana. So there we've, we've just declared an array and put three things in that array right out of the get-go. Okay. Now, one of the cool things about arrays is that if I send, for instance, my fruit object to my log event, which is this little event down here that I made, um, it's able to take that fruit object and output it. Because by default, it's going to call to string on that array. And the to string is going to turn an array, which is an actual list of things, into a string representation of that array with commas separating each of the values inside. So I'll go ahead and log out my fruit. We'll see what that looks like. Bada boom. We've got apple, orange, banana in what looks like a list with commas in between. It's actually just one big string that was converted from my actual array. Cool. Not rocket science. Very helpful. Very helpful to be working with these objects. Now, if I want to um, sort the fruit, so right now it's not in alphabetical order, is it? True. Apple, orange, banana. It's not alphabetical. I could call sort. Just cool. like that. That's cool. Let's try it. Now it's apple, banana, orange. So it sorted it for us. That's helpful. And there's a lot of these functions. So I've got a big list on the slide here of uh, at least most of the functions that are available to you. Um, in the Code Show project, you'll notice that there's a file in there called OchoJS. And a couple of array functions that I find particularly helpful, I, I put into OchoJS. So you can grab those if you'd like to and, and reap the benefits. But we'll look at some of these. Let's go ahead and push a new value onto this array. So there's fruit. Before we actually show it in a sorted fashion, let's push another fruit. Can you tell me a fruit that begins with A? Oh, thanks. <laughs> or how about B, C, or D? Any, <laughs> any early? <laughs> I, I, my mind just drew a blank, but I, I'm going to go with, uh, let's see, uh, a pear. Uh, well, that's kind of up there, though, isn't that? It's, it's fine. It's oh, fine. No. And we've already got an we apple got an is apple. the problem. Our, yeah. our tech guys recommended something we already have. Yeah. It's OK. We'll, we'll live. Let's, let's try the pair. I'm now pushing the pair value onto my array. OK? And then I'm going to, I'm going to um, log that, and I'm going to use the sort command to do that. So again, we are in alphabetical order. Pairs at the end of our list, but that's OK. <laughs> apple, I banana. for you. Yeah. <laughs> we run into blanks. Apple, banana, orange, pear. Then there's pop. Now pop knows to take its value off the end of the stack and doesn't need a value. So I'm going to push a certain value, but then I'm going to pop whatever is on the end of the stack. If you're not familiar with push and pop, this is a stack data structure where it's kind of like the, you know when you go to those, those all-you-can-eat buffets and <laughs> they, they have a stack of plates? And you know that the plate on the bottom has not been used in three years because by the time, before they get to the bottom, they always bring in some clean plates and put them on the top. So first in, first out. It's a data structure. That's what push and pop enables you to do. Who knew? Let's go ahead and run this. We put pair on, but we also took pair off. It's now gone. Yep. Push and pop. All right? Let's look at concat, and we're also going to look at slice and splice. So 
concat allows